branches are just names of, of commits, of, of, of which are ultimately of trees. Tags are something else. And um, the trunk, the closest thing you have to trunk is head. And what head is is merely the top, I believe, the top of the index. So head is actually, a, head is represented by a file. And there's multiple of them. So master is represented by this number, which is represented by this tree. So that's all, all uh, the names themselves don't even have to be the same between different developers, although not doing that would be ca cause insanity. And the closest thing you have to trunk is head, which is just the same, about the same thing. It just points to a rep. So whatever head is, it head points to a branch, and a branch points to a series of commits. This means, if you look at the history, you take one of these version numbers here, which are commit hashes, and you type checkout, you can check out at that point in time, and notice the helpful message that it says, that you've created a detached head, <clears throat> and you can look around and make changes, but if you really want to keep it, you probably need to give it a name, which you could do by making a new branch. Well, what you've done is you've gone into the repository to pull the particular commit out. Mm -hmm. Well, I looked at the history. I, did, I ran git log, and then that's a history of all the changes up to this point. So each one of these each one of these commits points to an object, and that object references a tree of other objects. <coughs> but that's, once again, this will get into, into implementation details. But, there, but to answer your question, there isn't, there's not a standard repository format convention because the, there's no convention to follow. It's, in, it's indicated by how the software is structured, by how Git, is, how Git stores things. So you don't have any choice in the matter. You have choice in what you name your branches, you can name your branches with slashes in them. A lot of people do that. So actually about useful conventions is branches that are short-lived typically are named, at least where I come from, topic and then probably a ticket number and then a description of the feature, which could probably end up being as simple as 30, 53 add jQuery UI stuff. Action at jQuery UI accordion. And then you would merge the branches together? Eventually, yeah, you hopefully you merge them together. Um, there's nothing special, so like if for instance, uh, there's nothing special about the branches in particular. The only thing that makes them special is their name. So if I wanted to not have a master, I could totally delete my master branch. It's gone now. There is no master branch. Uh, and as you remember, we went back in time, so whatever commits were in there, uh, they're still like, they still exist until they're cleaned out. But it would be diff somewhat difficult to find them right now. Um, but as far as I could, uh, as far as I as you could do, this could be your new master branch. Although by convention, that would be strange. In some places, we have branches every year because we have concurrent versions of the same software in different places. So instead of having one master branch, we actually have a year prefix and a master branch, which I don't recommend anyone doing. It's just a bizarre certain set of circumstances. So where your conventions lie in Git tends to be in how you name your branches and how you name your tags. Tags are something I don't actually use. Um, they are useful, but they're a little bit separate than branches. So if, you create, if I were to create a tag, which I don't know the syntax for right now, I thought tags and branches were basically dealt with the same way. They are almost the same thing. Tags will, uh, can have sick key, uh, GPG signatures on them and are kind of useful. Sure. I believe the kernel uses them a lot. But I, in my personal use, I have no experience with tags. So mer merging changes is something that's very hard to come up with in a demonstrational basis. But. Um, I'm not even I'm not even gonna try actually try doing that. You can make two to do 
So I think that if I Actually, I could do this. I could find where I've had a merge happen in the past. Look how linear my history is. Oh, there's a merge. So, <coughs> I need to get a copy of the commit hash. So what's the best way of looking at this? Yeah, we'll do that one. Go back to GitG. So, and this is a, a graphical program called GitG that lets you see kind of your history. You see all those yellow balls on the left? Those represent single commits. And where the lines diverge, you actually have merging going on. Diverging and merging? Yes, I'm trying to figure out a new way this view. So I've got the commit hash here. So this, uh, when to find that? Are you leaving, Bill? Yeah. Okay. There we are. It's up there. This is like a text version of what I was previously showing you. So if we look at back here, two lines of development diverged. And you have a commit here represented by a star. Actually, it's easier with hands, isn't it? So down here, we everyone had the same ancestor. Then at here, this had somewhere down there is an ancestor. And way up here had something as a different ancestor. So those changes were independent. And then there was another change here, which is added Sartax git up in it. And then at the top, I merged them together. If we look at that particular, if we were to be able to look at that particular commit, actually, with a shorter name, that should be somewhat easier. Kind of strange. I thought it used the short hashes for them, but I'm just going to do it this way. That was about 20 commits back. Oh, that one. So the question I was trying to answer, the question I was trying to show is what a merge looks like, um, but that I'm not going to get into. So. We have about half an hour left, and I would like to have more focus in this because I haven't really explained this in great detail. I think part of that's a limitation that I've imposed on myself on not describing de implementation details, which are actually kind of important. So questions like, 
use case questions, which is what this was really supposed to be about. And I know Brian over there already used, the other Brian already uses Git. So people that don't use Git that are sysadmins are the ones that I'd actually like questions from. How do you encourage a company to switch from subversion to Git? Use subversion. Branch, no, no, you know, I actually haven't answered that. Branch a lot. Make a lot of different branches, like for each, one branch for each, do that, though. for each feature. They do that. And they don't want to switch to Git? Oh. Are the developers already secretly using Git SVN? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm glad I didn't delete my master branch from my actual home directory. That would have sucked. Yeah, I have two origins. Well, two remotes. Yeah, two remotes. GitHub and... <coughs> so, Brian, uh, you, have, you, what have, you, have you ever used RCS? No. Other Brian. I mean, primary Brian. Original Brian. Can you book? Okay, have you ever used CVS? Um, I used a version system uh, back when I was programming in my first job back in 98. Was it Perforce? I don't remember. It's not hard. It was back in 98. Do you remember what you were using back in 98? I think I was still playing with dinosaurs. <laughs> Zip archives. <laughs> So if you've actually never used a version control system, the, the pr uh, proposition of using this is pretty simple because you just need to remember a cheat sheet of git add. Which actually, it's not really just mark a file. So actually, I should say git add or rm. Tell git about a file. Git commit. Record your changes to Git. That's and with those two commands, you can basically keep them all changed. And then when more complicated things come up, you reach for other tools. Get branch and get checkout, which is maintain separate lines of history. Because that's what branches are about, is separate lines of history. We, what I said earlier, I would just tongue in cheekly, is branch off and branch for every feature. So if you're implementing a feature in an application, it's really easy to talk about branches. But when you're actually doing system config files, it could be a little bit different. Where you might use branching for that is to have, say, three branches. Well, three, it might, might be more. Uh, is you would have staging, production, and probably development. Well, I, I has to haste that because usually the systems have less to them to do in the developer boxes, but I guess it's, it's more like a pre-staging. There you go. So if you had those as branch names and you had to, and you were in charge of say firewall rules, and now I'm reminded I'm not using Git currently for my personal box for uh, stuff I do, so I actually should. Uh, so what you would use branching for then, it becomes really easy. So I'm going to actually use that example, which is much simpler than home directory. So you have your system, and you have Git, and you have your right, conf common config file that you would want to care about the change of hosts, never mind. So you have your name, your host name database. And uh, for some reason, you already have nice static entries in there. And that host name actually changes. You know, point it to, uh, it's actually gone inside the firewall. Oh, well, that's some action. I worry about changes, and I haven't even committed this yet. So we're going to commit this. And I just write it and commit it, so the first commit message can be sloppy. And that's actually all that you'll do, but you want, but you already want to have your environment set up with the different branches. So I'm just going to do staging and prod. So you have your staging branch, 
And I'm just running the same command again from staging because the names right now don't matter. And I can illustrate that. If you see in the GUI, this is really easy to explain. You see three names, master, production, and staging. Those are all on the same line because they're the same thing. The only thing that's different is you have different is they have different names. But on production, uh, these entries were added by some joker that was just trying to get around uh, the DNS servers not being updated. So you totally don't need those. So you just delete them. Oh no, and I've just changed that file and I'm in the production branch. Hopefully I'm not on the production machine. Hopefully I'm doing this from remote. So actually what I want to do is I want to be on staging. I remove the slash git co or git checkout is what it will actually be on a default install. I thought co was a standard alias. Nope. I wish it was. Git checkout b name is how you create a new branch. The b basically means that the thing following it doesn't exist. Or it probably doesn't exist. But if it already exists, you will just use git checkout. So now, we are on staging. You will not have this in your prompt, probably. So you check. You are on staging. There's a star next to it. It's also green. So now you can commit that change. The standard command you use that is git commit. But you haven't added, you haven't added any files yet. You've modified the file. We've modified it in git. But in git, we have been typing gwrite, which actually just does git add again. Did you add a file that exists? And then you can commit it. But actually, you're a sysadmin, and you don't want to have to go through all that crap. So, in this case, check out when I pass the file name behaves differently. It means ignore the fact that I uh, doesn't. I would only change it if I change the contents out. To reset, and so now that change isn't in there because what you did as a sysadmin is you just went in and you made some changes. You saved the file, and you're going to type git commit dash a and it will just say that you're going to change all, the, commit all the files, add all the files, and commit all the files that you just changed. And if you're a boff, you might have stronger wording than that. Maybe not. So those changes are now committed, and they're on staging, but if we go, we can go back over and look in production. And uh, assuming we'll have these on multiple systems, get clone system system 2. System 2 is going to be on production, which is tracking upstream. We don't need to worry about that there. So if we go back to the original system directory, and we want to merge the change into production, there's a couple of different ways to do this. It really depends on your mental model. The easiest way I do it is you pull from the current directory and the branch name. So I'm going to pull the changings from staging into production. And then on system two, I will just pull the production changes down and they can pull down. And the files can modify over here. Where you could get into problems is assuming there's multiple sysadmins and maybe multiple people working on this without the best discipline, is they could go and they could add a host. Um, I don't know, this is just a random example. They don't like Google, so they're making so all traffic to Google doesn't go anywhere. And that breaks some like ad sets thing that's running on the production side. Um, and they're, we're going to go for the smart and slightly less sloppy case where they actually are committing this. So. so they made changes to production, the actual production box, but not the upstream production. So you're over here working in your original one. And what you decided is you actually need to do the same thing. Except you want to block www.google.com. Now this is a really strange way of blocking things. Not necessarily recommended, but you know, it's a weird place you're working. So. And they write a commit message. So now these two systems are not at all in the same state. In fact, their two productions look different. If you do git show, it shows that number. If you do it here, it shows a completely different number. So what happens if you pull? 
you get a merge fail. And right now, if you look at your branch, it'll say you're on production. And if you look at status, it'll say that you've got some stuff to fix, both modified. So you go in and you look at the file, and this is what you'll end up seeing. So the smart, the sensible thing to do um, is, you know, kind of depends on what the file is. What is enough to commit to run get that? To get what? So the screen open it right now. I just ran open the host file. This is what a commit a conflict looks like in Git. It writes the conflict markers out to the file as long as the text files, and you would see this. So Brian, what would you do at this point, other than curse at the other other person? Uh, we reboot. <laughs> Do you mind reboot? Oh, wait, sorry, not Windows. Uh, I'd uh, delete everything and have three lines uh, with lots of two zero zero two eight. Like that. And then yeah, also yeah. Yeah. So now we do that. And now it gets still unhappy. So what you actually have to do is add the file. It gets still not happy. It still says that um, you need to commit, so we're going to commit. And you notice there's extra text here. It actually says for the first line, merge production, a blah, conflicts, host. And you could add your own message here, like it was Bob that messed up the file. So you blame him, and you're done. <clears throat> you, once again, we've just merged that change on the system, too. System 1 still doesn't know anything about it, so you could try pushing it. But you can't push to currently checked out things. Normally, you'd be that would be a problem. But we're going to simulate it by pulling in the other direction. So you realize that uh, maybe you're a completely decentralized uh, setup, and that would be really weird. <clears throat> so you pull his change, and then if you look in the history, we show that thing I tried showing earlier, and a much simpler example. So we had we had a perfectly fine time at master. Staging, we did some changes. But then you can see after staging, there's these two commits. There's the green and the red. And they don't have little bubbles next to them because neither of those are in a branch anymore. They're in the history of two respective branches, but they don't, they're not the current. So the one at the top is production, is the branch that we're currently on. And it has those two things leading into it because the changes were merged. And that's about all there is about branching. And I think that covers what you would need to know to use it for the state of the purpose. One of the subcommands I like to use a lot of the command line is diff. Oh, but there's much better than diff. You can use, you could use gdiff. 